this evening we have the amazing practitioner author uh patricia lemer with us today and she's going to be talking about the amazing work that she does in the space of autism and behavior and the books that she's authored and one of them having to be one of my favorites uh this is the older version <laughs> i'll just morning awesome. the newer version <laughs> So Patty, for any of the people that are going to be watching this video, tell them a little bit about your experience in the autism world. How did you ever get started learning about this or, or in, involved in it? So I got a master's degree in counseling in a non-school setting. And what that meant was that I worked in hospitals and clinics with kids with all kinds of special needs. And every time I saw a child having difficulties, I wanted to know why, what was going on? What was the underlying issue? And my first job was as a psychologist in the late sixties. So there was no autism. And what we were dealing with were neurological issues and a lot of genetic disorders, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, kids who'd fallen out of trees, um, those kinds of issues. And I was really lucky. I was working under a neurologist and he said, well, maybe the child's allergic to wheat. I mean, this was really amazing in the sixties. Well, maybe his seizures are because he is, his nerves um, are sparking. And we know that the myelin sheath on the nervous system's made up of fat. So let's try a high fat diet. And that was before it even had a name. It's a key, ketogenic diet. And so we'd, he'd give the kids whipped cream and butter and their seizures would stop. Mm. And this was a multidisciplinary team with an occupational therapist and a speech pathologist and a physical therapist. And here I was, the, the right out of school psychologist trying to change behavior without understanding the cause of it. And a classic book at that time was called Dibs in Search of Self. And I don't know if you've read that, but it was how to do play therapy. And um, I was down on the floor doing play therapy with a child who didn't want to play with me. And in walked the occupational therapist and saw that I wanted to scream because I couldn't get the child to play. And I didn't understand why he was doing what he was doing. And the OT said to me, come down to my room. I got ball pits and scooter boards and um, all kinds of fun toys. And you'll see when you move a child through space and you let him touch things, he actually pays attention and looks at you and wants to play. And I'm having much more fun than you are. So you should have been an OT. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I wish I'd known about OTs. And so that was in the late 60s. By the 70s, the, the disabilities that showed up were learning disabilities. And here was a child who reversed letters and numbers. And here was Patty again saying, why is he reversing letters and numbers? And everybody said, because he's dyslexic. And I said, that doesn't explain the why. What's going on? And one day I got really lucky. And a mother said to me, you know, my child was called dyslexic. And someone said, have his eyes checked. And I'd already had his eyes checked and by my ophthalmologist. And this person said, no, 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 you need his vision checked and you need to go to a special kind of eye doctor called a developmental optometrist. And so I said, okay, show me one. And there was one down the street and I went to meet him and I became a best friend of developmental optometrists, which you've been introduced to because <laughs> they were getting to the root of the binocularity problem and the convergence insufficiency problem. And these were terms I had not heard. And they were doing something called vision therapy, which was helping those problems. And then the child could learn to use his eyes together and he was no longer dyslexic. And so that was the seventies and the eighties. 
No, by the 80s, we then looked at attention deficit disorder. <laughs> and again, I was the heretic. Why is the child not paying attention? What did he eat for breakfast? Maybe it's making him hyperactive. You know, why is, um, maybe he didn't get enough sleep. Maybe it's a, a food that's a problem. So again, I was trying to figure out the whys. And I saw some tapes by a woman named Doris Rapp, R-A-P-P, -P, who wrote a book called, Is This Your Child? Which has become a classic. And she showed how she could take perfectly angelic kids and turn them into monsters by giving them some food that was not good for them. So that was the 80s. And by the 90s, these kids showed up who were really different. They were a combination of these vision and sensory and motor and language issues. And all of a sudden we, had, we were hearing about this thing called autism. And because I had had 30 years of work with these other disability areas, I could apply that to these new group of kids. And I was an instant autism expert because I had seen one kid with autism and nobody else had seen any. And so I was looking at what's causing this behavior. And I already had started a nonprofit called Developmental Delay Resources, DDR. And we were publishing a newsletter. We were putting on conferences. We'd actually gotten a website early on. And so we were helping these parents look at what was the underlying causes, what were the causes of some of their kids' problems. So I kind of evolved into this multidisciplinary um, counselor and I wasn't doing any of the therapies. I was referring to people who were doing the therapies, which gave me a little more credibility because I wasn't feeding myself with with, oh, you need what I'm selling. You mm -hmm. know? So, so that's how a, the long version of how I got into it. And then um, I, we got much more involved in the biomedical uh, parts of autism. And there were, we, we saw the relationship between the gut and the brain and the, the mind and the body and the motor and the vision and the, the food you eat and the behavior you see. And so it all just came together gradually as, as our technology got better, as they started studying the genetics of autism, we started seeing what the risk factors were. Many of these families gave us the same histories over and over and over again of a kid who was a, um, a cranky baby, who was a picky eater, who didn't talk, or who talked and then stopped talking, regressed. And um, we could see early on what some of the risk factors were. So we started looking at how we could prevent this um, from getting full blown into autism. And that, that fascinates me because that's, that aligns with, with my trajectory too, because it's always, <laughs> You're always wondering about the why, why, why. The, the picture right. that came to mind when you were describing that, right? Everybody wants to put a label. But if, if right. let's say that you pick a food out from the grocery store, let's say that you pack, you pick a pack of chicken nuggets for your child. And you look on the front, it tells you what the label is. But when you delve further in, it's like you're turning it over and looking at the ingredients. What is currently in that child? What do we have? You know, what extra do we need to, to, put into their diet? What do we need to take out of their diet? What other services right. do we need to be looking at? What comprehensive information do we need for this child as a whole? So I, it's beautiful to hear that, that that's your approach. I love it. Thank you. And so, you know, what you just said was really the mantra of the wonderful Sydney Baker. And Sid Baker was one of the very first people um, of the Defeat Autism Now movement um, that Bernie Rimlin started. And his basic idea was get the bad stuff out and put the good stuff in. And that is the basis of, of helping a kid maximize his potential and have better behavior, more 
acceptable behavior. Yeah. And, and what I learned from the OTs is that behavior is a message. It's a communication, the way the child is communicating with you. And when he's banging his head against the, the wall or the door, it's because his head hurts. There's something going on in his head. His brain is inflamed. He's not being a bad kid. And when he's stimming, that stimming has a reason. It has a meaning. It's his way of saying, this is too much. Or maybe if I do it on this side, this eye will turn on. So stimming is not something that needs to be extinguished because it's the child's only, the nonverbal child's only way of communicating with you and telling you what's going on. And so we have to be a detective. And that's why I called the radio show that I do the autism detectives, because we've got to look at those clues. Those behaviors are the clues and their behavior is just the tip of the iceberg. It's telling you what those foundational issues are that might be causing it. Mm -hmm. And that's perfect because it, it's framing the right questions, knowing what questions to ask, but the relevance they have to discovering that child's problems. And, and it's such I, a big picture. You know, I sometimes find myself asking a question of a family that I've never asked before. And that's where you use your knowledge and your intuition and your experience to say, you know, I think I saw this before in a child who had rosy red cheeks and who had 15 ear infections that required him to have tubes. Did your child drink a lot of milk? I said one day. And then when they said, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> and has he been on a lot of rounds of antibiotics how did you know mm -hmm. you know because I've seen a lot of kids like yours oh no she said my kid is unique my pediatrician said this was 1990 my mm -hmm. pediatrician said he never saw a kid like mine well then he's blind because he didn't ask the right questions yeah and a lot of those kids who end up with an autism label start out as picky eaters, milk drinkers, ear infection kids who are put on antibiotics after antibiotics. And so this, we know this sequence of events and we can cut it off at the pass by saying, take away the milk. You know, kid, why are we drinking milk from another mammal? It doesn't make any sense. And we later discovered that the casein in the milk was combining with the gluten in a lot of the, the grains and the, the baked goods and having an opiate effect on our kids. They were drugged and they didn't just want a glass of milk and cookies. They needed a glass of milk and cookies. So this, you know, this history is so important for the parents of today to know. Karen Sarusi's book on um, helping her child who had PDD, which we don't even use that expression anymore, pervasive developmental disorder. She was the one who dug up this old research on gluten and casein and opiates. Well, how many pediatricians today ask a parent, what is your child eating? Not that many. What is he having for breakfast? What do he have for lunch? What does his behavior look like? Do his ears get red? Do his cheeks get rosy? That's not because it, it's cold outside. That's a reaction. That's a food reaction. And Doris Rapp wrote about that in the 70s. And you know that book, Is This Your Child, is still as good as it was when she she made it. it it's a, turned into a classic. Yeah. And that's, that's such a good point you make too, Patty, because the tendency is towards everybody concentrating on their own approach and not even being open to those things. And that's what I want to try to do through this interview and the others that I've done is open people's minds up to a more holistic approach to behavior because 
when we close our eyes and we shut out any other possibilities, we're closing the door on opportunities for the children and, and the individuals that we serve. So really just hoping that people watching this will have a more open mind perspective about what is going on and just talking about the interconnectedness of the body and how, you know, the root causes are so, so important. Speaking of the root causes, let's talk about your book. So what sparked you to write a book after all this experience? <laughs> because my brain was ready to explode and mm. it didn't have room for the new things that were coming. And so I had to download it into the computer to make room for more. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. I totally understand that. And frankly, I was, I'd been doing it for 40 years. And I got tired of saying the same thing over and over again. And parents needed a one-stop reference volume that they, I could say, you know, you've got to read about this in my book and then I'll be happy to talk to you and you can ask me any questions that are different than what you've read in the book or about your child specifically. There's a, a cliche that describes what you were just saying and, it's, a, it's one that I, I've always loved. And it's, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if you're an OT, he needs OT. If you're, he's not talking and you're a speech pathologist, we need speech pathology. If his behavior is out of order, then we need a behavioral specialist. And so what I want is for the hammers to become a whole tool chest. And that's what I love about what you're doing. You're putting you. so many amazing tools in your tool chest that allow you to decide, do I need a wrench or do I need a hammer? You know, what, which is the priority for this child? So in my book, I, the subtitle is Build Healthy Foundations for, for um, I have to look at it because for communication, socialization and behavior. And so the healthy foundations are good food, a good night's sleep, um, proper alignment, uh, all systems go, the child's pooping, the child's breathing well, the child um, can has stamina, his mitochondria are, his batteries are charged. And so, so many kids go into a therapy without those basic foundations of a healthy breakfast and a good night's sleep. And so I wrote a whole chapter on lifestyle choices. So if people want more resources, including your book, how can they find it? My book's on Amazon. It's available as both a, a soft cover book, three, three things, a soft cover book. Um, it's on Kindle and it's on um, an audio book now. Oh, wonderful. I love Audible. <laughs> yeah, I have a website, Patricia Lemmer, L-E-M-E-R dot com. And my book has a website, outsmartingautism.com. And on both of those websites, I have a ton of um, interviews like this. And some of them are also presentations as much as two hours that I've given, which go into much more depth on the food, on the sensory, on the motor, on the language, on some of the root causes of the social and emotional and communication issues and the behavioral issues. And I don't even get to speech and language and making friends until about two thirds, three quarters of the way through the book. The book also has, and I don't know if you see older kids, the book also has sections on um, what happens when they get older, how to write a transition plan, how to plan for the future when mommy and daddy aren't here anymore, um, how to work the system uh, to get them accommodations in the workplace, what are, where are they going to live um, after they can't live with you anymore. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, complicated red tape 
and how to get through some of that. Well, I think it's just fantastic what you've done and put it uh, in a book. So it's helped guide our practice and, and many other people. So well, thank you. Yeah, we're going to be sure to share it with our parents as a resource. And um, hopefully we'll be able to have more of these interviews and any other books that you <laughs> put out there. And we'll be sure to well, have every chapter you. has resources in it. Thank you so much for the work that you have done over the last oh, several decades. Um, I'm so excited you're you're carrying the baton forward. <laughs> I love you. I love that the, we have a new generation of, of people who are more holistic and multidisciplinary that understand all the different parts. Well, you've done you've done a lot of the work, so you've made it easier for me. Uh, not that it's very easy, but it's you've made it a lot easier. So I really appreciate the work you've done and I appreciate your time this evening. And um, we're you. definitely going to share the, for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So take care. Thanks so much, Patty. Okay.